Good afternoon. I'm Juliane Camfield, the director of Deutsches Haus at NYU. Welcome to our virtual event, Journalists as Hate Object, Populism, Authoritarianism, and the Free Press, a moderated discussion which Deutsches Haus at NYU is delighted to co-present with La Maison Française of NYU. In this conversation, press critic Jay Rosen, who will be this event's moderator, philosopher Jason Stanley, historian Ruth Ben Giat, and journalist Klaus Blinkboimer and Mathieu Maliudex will examine how the global rise of populist parties and authoritarian leaders is focusing the politics of resentment on journalists and their institutions. This is, of course, a very pertinent issue right now, as clearly reflected in the shocking number of more than 300 freedom of press incidents that have been reported in the US since the start of the protests in the wake of George Floyd's horrific death. This number, which includes arrests and assaults of the press, is an obvious indication of the freedom of the press being under increasing attack, a very worrisome development. How can the established press respond to this phenomenon and how can we better understand this troubling development and counteract it? These are some of the questions we will be investigating and discussing today. Before I briefly introduce our speakers, I would like to extend heartfelt thanks to Francine Goldenhar, Lisa Chow, and Francois Nudelman from NYU's La Maison Française, our wonderful NYU colleagues and co-presenters of this event. To my excellent Deutsches House at NYU colleagues, Zara Gerner, whom you just saw, Christian Mendonca, Hotaka Nakamura, and Sabrina Schmidt. To the DAAD, the German Academic Exchange Service, for continuously providing Deutsches Haus at NYU with support for our academic programming. To the Penn World Voices Festival, especially to Chibrali for their openness and enthusiasm to include this conversation in their festival in May, which, as we all know, sadly, could not take place because of COVID. I would also like to thank our five distinguished panelists for joining us during this eventful and turbulent time. And a very big thank you goes to Jay Rosen, who initiated the conversation about this event. And just in case you don't know about Deutsches Haus at NYU, we are New York's leading institution for culture and language of the German speaking world. And our work focuses on and fosters transatlantic dialogue and exchange, still much needed in current times. Should you be interested in learning or improving your German language skills, please join us for our classes open to the general public, which will start next week. But now some bio info about our distinguished panelists. Ruth Van Giet is professor of history and Italian studies at NYU and is an expert on fascism, propaganda and authoritarian leaders. Her political commentary appears in op-eds and interviews in the Washington Post, the New York Times, CNN, MSNBC, ABC News, and many other venues. Klaus Blinkboimer is a journalist, TV presenter, author, and filmmaker. For 25 years, he worked for Der Spiegel as a reporter, author of numerous cover stories, and as the magazine's US correspondent. He became Der Spiegel's deputy editor-in-chief in 2011 and editor-in-chief in 2015. Today, Klaus Brinkbäumer writes for the weekly newspaper Die Zeit and Der Tagesspiegel with his column Spiegelstrich, which focuses on politics and language. He is finalizing work on his first documentary film. Mathieu Magnodex is a staff journalist and the US correspondent for Mediapart an independent French investigative news website. He is the writer of two books about the Arab Spring in Tunisia and Emmanuel Macron's presidential campaign and a co-founder of the French Association of LGBTI plus journalists. He recently published his third book, The Ocasio-Cortez Generation, The New American Activists. Jay Rosen teaches journalism at NYU, where he has been on the faculty since 1986. From 1999 to 2005, 
He served as chair of the department. Jay Rosen is the author of PressThink.org. In 2018, he was a fellow at the Bosch Foundation in Berlin, studying German press think. His articles on politics and the press have appeared in Columbia Journalism Review, The Nation, The Guardian, The New York Review of Books Online Edition, The Washington Post, and The Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. Jason Stanley is the Jacob Arowski Professor of Philosophy at Yale University. He is the author of Know How, Languages in Context, Knowledge and Practical Interests, how propaganda works and how fascism works, the politics of us and them. He's a frequent contributor to the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Boston Review and the Chronicle of Higher Education, among other publications. We will start this event with short opening remarks by our five speakers in the following order. Jason Stanley, Ruth Ben Giat, Klaus Brinkbäumer, Mathieu Manudex and Jay Rosen. But first, let me hand things over to Jay Rosen now. The floor is all yours, Jay. Thank you. Our first speaker is Jason Stanley, and I believe he is ready to go. Jason. That's better. Since I'm the first speaker, I'm going to take myself my goal to be the easy one of just presenting the basic problem as I see it. So the basic problem for journalism right now is that in what I've called fascist politics in my work, uh, there's a certain kind of ideology that sees the world through a friend enemy distinction. You're either with the authoritarian leader or you're against the authoritarian leader. So there's only two sides. You're with them or against them. And reality doesn't work like that. Reality is much more complex and doesn't have a side. So this places journalism at a quandary. They can either be with the authoritarian leader or against them. So that's the problem. If the media is on the other side of, from the authoritarian leader, then it's a war. And journalists are targets in that war. And this raises the cost of being a journalist. It makes it harder to be a journalist. Uh, it made, makes it harder to practice the craft. And that's one goal of this politics, is to raise the cost of being a journalist. And this is why you see people like Patricia Campos, Brazil's Patricia Campos Mello, uh, who argued, who is responsible for breaking the story about social media intervention, about uh, Bolsonaro's illegal use of social media, uh, to bypass campaign finance laws in Brazil, Ranu Ayub uh, in India. Uh, these are targeted journalists. Uh, the goal, so it's also to discredit the media, to politicize them, to make them part of the opposition party. I mean, in this kind of ideology, there's only the enemy and the leader. Uh, and, and as we, so then if everyone is just, if just an us them thing, then no one is pursuing the truth. Uh, and then, you know, everyone sees things in the prism. And that's the, and then if and it's particularly useful if there's uh, information about you that you want to be, uh, that you don't, that you want to be discredited before it even arrives. So you, you remove the information source as, well, they're just motivated by a partisan politics. So the goal, as my, one of my editors once said to me, you can't write the news if you are the news. And the goal of these authoritarian leaders is to, make, is to make the journalists the news and therefore not purveyors of the news. So, uh, so that's the problem. Uh, the difficulty is how to, get, uh, how to avoid getting caught in one side uh, of this war, how to, how to extricate yourself from this us-them us, distinction and, it's possible, is it, and uh, restore trust. Now, here's the thing. It's a very hard problem. <laughs> it's, there's no obvious way to restore trust. And I will just finish by, I'm no doubt not going to be the first person to criticize this strategy, by showing why present all sides as a strategy is not a way to restore trust. So if you look at authoritarian leaders from Hitler on, they attack the media as, as using faux objectivity. Uh, 
So if you, uh, because they're, they're being selective about what they present. So, uh, and the fact is you have to be selective about what you present. You can't present every side because we only have a, a finite amount of time. You have to pick what's central. Picking what's central is gonna be a value judgment. Uh, I think we have to be upfront about those value judgments because if we're not upfront about those value judgments, uh, our failure to present all sides will be manifest and, uh, and exploited and we will be attacked for not doing the impossible. Uh, Ruth, I'm gonna now hand it over to you. Ruth ben -Gaya. Thanks, Jason. Glad to be here. Who are you essential to? Asked a New York Police Department officer on June 5th that he, as he shoved a badged AP videographer covering a protest. The encounter was witnessed by the photographer and activist, George DeCastro Day. Of course, the officer knew the answer. The videographer was there to document one episode in a historic wave that's uh, sweeping America now and pol police reactions to it uh, from, for the public's eyes and ears. And this and Donald Trump's America made the journalist a threat, someone who deserved the physical mistreatment that he got. Yet the officer's comment goes beyond this. It denied the legitimacy of the journalist's job altogether. So while individual journalists can become targets in stable democracies if they probe too deeply into abuses of power, making journalists as a group into hate objects is a phenomenon more typically uh, associated with authoritarian societies. Silvio Berlusconi in Italy uh, in the early 2000s pioneered the path that we're on today in America where an authoritarian minded leader governed within a degraded democracy claiming he's the victim of witch hunts by a press that he harasses and censors in every way he can. Whatever form it takes, authoritarianism means the end of transparency and accountability and the suppression or manipulation of information that doesn't fit the leader's self-serving vision of reality. So we can see why journalists become hate objects. Now, if we step back a bit, unless he takes power by coup, turning the public against journalists is part of how authoritarians get to power in the first place. The decay of truth and decay of democracy proceed hand in hand, starting with his assertion that the establishment media delivers false or biased information while well, he speaks the truth and does everything and risks everything to get the facts out. Removing public trust in journalism and inculcating hostility is also kind of an insurance policy for these rulers. All of them are terribly corrupt. And when journalists expose their crimes, they need the public to already see journalists as compromised. Then the era of alternative facts, as Kellyanne Conway called them in 2017, can truly begin. And we often hear that Trump is incompetent or lazy, but that's not true at all about things he cares about, like this issue. He doesn't have a fraction of the media control that the people he uh, admires, like Erdogan or Orban or Putin have, and he doesn't have the television networks of Berlusconi. So he's had to work very, very hard for now almost five years since the start of his campaign to turn journalists, journalists into hate objects. Simply put, and rather bluntly put, while many Americans already hated or distrusted migrants, Muslims, and other groups he's targeted, making journalists into people who uh, one might wish physical harm on uh, took a lot of uh, work. And so he made this part of his ritual of his campaign very early, uh, penning up journalists, saying, lock them up, you know, transferring that chant from Hillary Clinton onto them. And what we're seeing today is a direct result of this daily, very engineered strategy for years to, to deal with the problem that Trump has, that he's not, he, he's, he's reigning right now, reigning as he'd like to, in a fully functioning democracy, a degraded democracy. And he has journalists who are exposing his, his violence and his corruption every day. So whatever happens in November, uh, and we, he may go way beyond what Berlusconi did, it's going to take a sustained work of civic education, bridge building, and re-education to restore trust in journalists and have people see them as individuals legitimated to do their job rather than enemies of the people. And I'll hand it over to Klaus now. 
Thank you so much, Ruth. For 30 years, I've been traveling between uh, Germany and the US, um, traveling here uh, to cover uh, elections and to, to write about so many different topics. And I've been living here three times. The first time was in uh, 88, 89, uh, 90s, when in Europe, um, the walls fell when the Soviet empire broke and, um, and being in the US at that time really made me believe in this country because it felt so well strong. The democracy felt strong, it felt stable, it felt, uh, it didn't feel uh, like an arrogant country. Um, and of course it was a wonderful time to be here. Then things after actually not too long after just a few years turned wrong after 9-11 the financial crisis i was back in the u.s living here from 2007 to 2011 covering the financial crisis and the obama years and again i really believed in uh, the strength of american democracy and when i came back here a little more than a year ago 18 months ago i really wondered what had happened to this country because it had lost so much of its stability of its belief in itself. And um, we want to talk about media today, but the way people trust each other, um, the discrepancy of um, how much money people are making between the rich and the poor, the uh, differences concerning education have become huge and too big. Talking about the media, I think a couple of things have happened. Um, framing, that's one of these terms of the times, has really succeeded. Uh, framing in terms of, um, well, one thing is the radical left is trying to silence us on the right. It's not true, as people who really focus on facts know, but it has succeeded. This legend is out there and a lot of people believe in it. The term fake news used by the president himself with his 80 million, million uh, Twitter fo uh, followers has succeeded too. People, uh, too many people, way too many people are believing that lots of serious media organizations are not covering facts, are not really trying to find out what's true anymore. Um, I think a couple of television stations have become too sensationalist. Maybe they were before and I didn't recognize it, but um, the way um, cable TV is focusing on the president and solely on the president, only Trump, 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 Trump every minute of their time because it's a business model, because it's working, um, is wrong. It's not covering reality in, in the way they should be doing this. If I compare all of this to Germany, the situation in the country um, where I come from, you can see a lot of tendencies which are similar. Um, in Germany, there are attacks on the media. At Der Spiegel, we've been attacked. Now I'm working for Die Zeit. We are constantly being attacked. The term Lügenpresse, lying press, is a Nazi term and it's being used today. But it's much less terrible than it is here and it's much less threatening. I think the media over there are, are a little calmer. Are, it's a, a generaliz generalizations are always dangerous, but uh, a little more focusing on the worldview and not on a single person like Trump. We have, we in Germany, have public television and radio programs which are um, stronger than PBS or NPR, um, who are just singular organizations, but not really the big ones in Germany. These public um, stations are one main source of media consumption. Uh, of course, there's a scientist uh, running the government and not uh, Donald Trump. That's a big difference. Um, strategy, a political strategy um, still is able to come through. You can see it in uh, the way Germany is dealing with COVID-19. Uh, of course, media are questioning what the government is doing, but uh, there is a common ground. People are believing in facts because politicians are trying to understand it and to really find ways that suit the people. Big difference. Um, and I'm not saying that it cannot go wrong in Germany, but uh, maybe we'll get into that later, but that's a difference. It's not, you, you see the same tendencies, but not in the American way yet. 
And with this, I'm handing it over to Mathieu. Thank you, Klaus. Uh, good evening, and thank you uh, for having me tonight. Um, as a journalist covering the US, I'm saddened, but not really surprised by the images of American journalists being arrested physically targeted or prevented from doing their work uh, in your country. Unfortunately, what's happening in Trump's America today has been happening in Macron's France for the last three years. Yes, under the presidency of the very same 40-year-old energetic Kennedy-like president who was seen around the globe when he was elected as Trump's exact opposite. Um, he was elected in 2017 against far-right leader Marine Le Pen a few months after Donald Trump's victory. Of course, Donald Trump, uh, Emmanuel Macron is not an authoritarian leader, but he uses the, the distrust against the press to avoid accountability. Let me start with the short story. On February 4th, 2019, two prosecutors and some police officers knocked on the door of Mediapart, the newsroom I've been a member of for a decade, which is located on the first floor of a building in the eastern part of Paris near a very cute garden, and, and the Paris prosecutor's office, which is under the direct authority of the government, had sent uh, these people to search our newsroom, uh, media part of the most famous investigative media in France, an independent subscribers only advertising free news media, which was launched 11 years ago and has now become a reference in France and beyond. They did so as part of an investigation into our reporting on the French president's former top security officer, a man called Alexandre Benalla. Just some days after, we published a long story on this man. So we published this story and they came. Uh, Benalla had been dismissed three months before that from the presidency after video footage showed him beating a protester during May Day 2018 demonstrations in Paris. That day, he was dressed as a police officer, though he's not a police officer. The story became a huge scandal. This day, my, my colleagues eventually refused to open the door. We had the right to do so because these people did not have a proper warrant. And of course, we denounced an unprecedented attack against journalism, an attack against the legitimate right of the public to know, and an, ad an attempt to find and intimidate our sources. Um, this story is a perfect summary of what you face right now in France as journalists when you want to really do your work. Uh, in a country where laws have been protecting the press for decades, journalism has become a target for the presidency that sadly does not hesitate to manipulate the opinion and regularly use the Trumpian playbook of fake news to discredit our work. Uh, recently, other journalists for different outlets were intimidated. Uh, in, in 2019, seven investigative journalists were summoned for questioning by the intelligence services after the Paris prosecutor's office opened an investigation against them for revealing a national defense secret. These journalists were working on the sale of French weapons to Saudi Arabia and their use against civilians in the Yemen civil war. Uh, they were also working on this Ben Allah affair. And just a few days ago uh, this year, a journalist for Mediapart working on police abuse has been summoned by the watchdog of the French police, but this watchdog people were not looking for the wrongdoings of police officers, they were looking for her sources, and of course she did not answer the questions. Um, sadly, this French story I'm telling right now is not just a story of harassment. Uh, during this presidency, many journalists covering demonstrations have been personally targeted and sometimes arrested by the police. This is totally new in France. Many freelance journalists in particular were arrested and physically hurt. And during this demonstration, the goal of the government was clear, pushing well-established journalists of well-established media to break with these colleagues that were described by, as activists or leftists by the government or the police, while they were actually documenting the numerous cases of police abuse. Um, and during this moment, due to police violence, three people died, five people lost their hands, 27 lost their eyes, 340 people got a hand injury, and several journalists were hurt. And for the French government, sadly, a good journalist is a journalist that doesn't speak about police brutality because this word is not even used, police violence is not even used uh, by the government. We have a press that is no longer seeking the truth, Macron said in June 
2018, as he was summoned by the press to explain why his personal bodyguard had been had been seen beating demonstrators, had been protected by his own close advisors, and had some murky, really weird connections with foreign oligarchs. And since then, sadly again, this government, who pretended to fight fake news when he was elected uh, against this far right leader, has been producing its own fake news. It was the case in, in the case in the Benalla story, this bodyguard story, when President Macron like gave credit to a doleful theory that was supposed to exonerate his protege. It was also the case very recently during the pandemic when the government said on, on several instances that there was no need to use protective masks just because they did not have the proper mask to protect the population. Just a few words to, to finish about the political logic of this. Um, Emmanuel Macron's spokeswoman, Sibeth Ndiaye, said one day she gladly lies to protect the president. Ironically enough, she denied having said so. In our French Republican monarchy, lies are clearly a way to avoid accountability. And this is sadly the case for Emmanuel Macron. Emmanuel Macron is not Donald Trump, but he uses kind of the same tactics, tactics sometimes, producing an alternative narrative made to blur his own failure. And once again, he says he's already, always been saying he's passionate about fighting fake news. And he was elected against this uh, far-right leader who blatantly used lies and plays on fears and quotes Steve Bannon as an inspiration. So, of course, she was some kind of worse, but he's also sometimes, sadly, using some kind of Trumpian playbook against the press. Um, he has uh, very often criticized the work of the press, playing on the mistrust of the journalism may inspire to some people, especially when journalists try to describe its overuse of communication and to deconstruct its own storytelling. No access today has become a norm, no accountabilities uh, very often, and bullet points and communication tools have become the main language of this government. In France, many people compare the political language of Macron to Newspeak, you know, the official language of dystopian superstate Oce Oceania in George Orwell's novel 1984. Um, I'm sorry to describe the situation like that, but I, I guess that's the way many journalists are seeing the situation right now in France. And now I'm going to pass it over to Jay. Thank you very much. Uh, for my five minutes, I uh, want to make some points about how Donald Trump's use of journalists as a hate object connects in interlocking fashion with other features of his political style. First, uh, journalists as hate objects for Donald Trump fulfills a campaign promise that has become a kind of brand promise for uh, Trump uh, as a uh, celebrity in the White House. And the promise that he made to his supporters during the campaign, implicit and in many ways explicit, was I will put these people down for you. The, the media that you hate, I hate them as well. And I'm going to treat them with the disrespect and the disgust that I know you feel for them. And um, for his supporters and fans, this is almost the perfect embodiment of resentment politics. I'm not sure exactly why, um, but among educated professionals, journalists are like the perfect representation of the elite that they. Uh, resent. So Trump couldn't deliver on building a wall. He couldn't deliver on draining the swamp. Um, he had no intention of um, reducing economic inequality, but putting journalists down for his supporters is something that he can deliver not once, but every day. Secondly, uh, journalists as hate objects teaches his hardcore supporters to pre-reject the reporting that comes from the national media, much of which is openly critical of Donald Trump. So 
this destroys a kind of lever of accountability since for his um, hardcore fans, everything in the mainstream press is uh, false by definition. Uh, therefore, the more outrageous Trump gets, the more uh, news, critical news coverage he generates, uh, the more his supporters believe that honest journalists are out to get him, a belief that he encourages from the beginning, as uh, I think Ruth already explained to us. So this pre-rejection of public service journalism creates a kind of freedom from fact for Donald Trump, freedom from fact. And my third point is that related to this freedom from fact that he has successfully negotiated for himself are parallel attacks on other institutions and professions that, uh, like journalists, try to provide some sort of factual check on the president or uh, institutions that try to recall the president to reality in some way. So in addition to his treatment of journalists as hate objects, we can list things like his disdain for the morning briefing. The morning national security briefing used to be the first thing that all American presidents did uh, when they got to the Oval Office. Uh, Trump is famous for, for skipping the briefing or pay, barely paying attention, uh, showing how impatient he is making the briefers draw him pictures rather than read him words. Obviously, he doesn't do the reading. He's like the worst student in the world. So he has essentially rejected that ritual of the intelligence briefing. But it goes beyond just the briefing. He has contempt for the intelligence community as a whole, all the intelligence agencies. We can add to this the put down of the nation's diplomatic corps, who represent um, experience and knowledge about America's relationship to other countries. The diplomatic corps is being dismantled under Trump. Then there's the attack on expertise and professionalism of every kind throughout the government, the best symbol of which is probably the extremely mediocre level of talent that he recruits uh, into his government, people who don't know very much because they haven't done very much in their lives. There's also the interference with government science, especially the EPA that has become quite serious. The pressure on civil servants, which we learned a lot about during the impeachment um, trial. The attacks on the inspectors general, who, who like journalists are independent fact finders. Uh, and these people too are, are being fired, criticized, um, embarrassed by uh, the president. And of course, there's the refusal to cooperate with congressional oversight, which um, is also fact finding in some way. So freedom from fact is a much bigger project than just his enemy of the people rhetoric, uh, a campaign against the, against the press. Then fourth, this in turn makes his supporters more dependent on either Fox News or Donald Trump himself for news and information about Donald Trump. Between 20 and 30% of the American public now has kind of been isolated in an information loop of its own where their major source of information about Trump is Trump or Fox News, which is constantly in contact with Trump. And this is what has given rise to the notion of post-truth politics, but it goes beyond that. This, the point is that this is much deeper than just um, political polarization. This is an estrangement from reality that Trump is creating among his movement or you could also call it the unbuilding of the public for news. So to pull some of this together and to illustrate what I mean by interlocking features of Trump's political style, let's go back to the first working day of the Trump presidency in uh, 2017. 
which was dominated by Sean Spicer's appearance in the White House briefing room to attack the press for accurately reporting on smaller crowds for Trump's inauguration than showed up for Obama's inauguration. Now in this one act, which remember was the first act of the Trump presidency in its relationship with the press, uh, he not only demonstrated uh, his contempt for journalists as a hate object, but um, Sean Spicer's performance led to uh, astonished headlines and they dominated the talk shows and Trump um, thereby debuted his strategy of taking up all the oxygen uh, in the room. This performance by Sean Spicer in which he berated the journalists for accurately reporting on smaller crowd sizes. And then if you recall, refused to take questions. He just turned on his heel and walked out of the room. To Trump's supporters, this was the fulfillment of a campaign promise. We will put these people down for you, as I said before. To Trump's critics and haters, this was something to go crazy over and express astonishment and rage about, which further entertains and pleases his supporters. That's uh, the slang expression for it in American English is owning the libs. So just making people go crazy is itself a contributor to Trump's political style. Um, it was a show of power as well, this performance on day one in the briefing room because Trump never um, had to go back on his claim that his crowds were bigger. Uh, even with side-by-side -side photographs that were uh, devastating in what they showed, he never backed down, he never corrected himself, um, nobody around him could contradict him. And it wasn't um, that he gave a believable performance, it's that his refusal to acknowledge factual reality was itself a demonstration of power as many students of authoritarianism, including some of the people we have here today have, have said. Uh, finally, for the uncommitted people who are not fans of Donald Trump or hardcore critics of Trump, Donald Trump, these kinds of episodes have a different meaning. They say there's no point in paying attention because people are just arguing with each other and you can't find out what the truth is because the search costs for actually getting reliable information are too high, so you may as well give up and, and go shopping. So all of this happened on the first day of the Trump presidency, and all of those parts fit together in a kind of uh, political style where each uh, piece uh, strengthens the other pieces. Now, when I say these are interlocking parts and they all fit together, I don't mean to say that it's the result of some brilliant strategy or that um, Trump has some sort of um, genius uh, in him which allows for uh, this design. It's, um, it's more, uh, much more instinctive than that. And what it really is, is the ruins of his personality meeting up with the powers of the American presidency. So that's my introduction to my perspective. And now the panelists are going to talk about themselves a little bit. So first, is there anybody who wanted to ask a question of another panelist? Let's do that first. Okay, then I have a question for all of you. Um, this phenomena of uh, journalists losing trust is related but distinct from a larger phenomena, which is eroding trust in government institutions of all kinds. So I'd like to know what our panelists think about the relationship between the erosion of trust in journalists and the erosion of social trust as well as trust in the political system. And before you answer, I just want to add a thought of my own. One of the curiosities for me about the erosion of trust in journalism, which has been in poll figures declining since the mid-70s, 
is when I ask journalists about this, they give me this same answer. They say, well, the trust is declining in all institutions, Jay. And I always thought that was kind of a strange answer because if the press is the watchdog of those institutions, then you would think when they start performing poorly and losing trust, that would be an opportunity for journalists to reveal what's wrong with those institutions and gain trust, like with Watergate, where, which brought a surge of trust to the American press after uh, the presidency proved it could not be trusted. So, uh, so my question is, what do you think the relationship is between trust in the press and these larger declines in trust which we're seeing not just in the US, but in democracies worldwide. Who wants to tackle that? Uh, let's start with Jason. Uh, so I, I think part of it has to do with the attack on democracy that you have in the United States and capitalism, essentially, because the idea, democracy has public institutions, uh, public institutions that are there for the public good. What we've had since the 1980s, early 1980s, is an attack on public goods. And a shared information space is a key public good for a democracy, like a public education system, like public universities, like public institutions generally. And I think what you have an attack on is the idea of a public uh, mm -hmm. as we move from democracy into a kind of libertarian privacy, we're reminded that democracy has at its center democratic institutions. Mm. Mm. Who else wants to add, tackle that question? Klaus? Yeah, I think, um, I think of course it's connected and sometimes it's a little, uh, I, I think you could say even coincidental. Uh, take Germany as an example. In 2016, when the so-called refugee crisis, that's the term that's being used, uh, began um, with Germany opening uh, its borders. Germany didn't literally do that, but they, but Germany let let a lot of, lot of uh, refugees in. Let, uh, the, the, the borders weren't closed before that, but still, Germany did. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Then uh, most media supported what the government did, and they really welcomed the people coming in from. Uh, mostly Africa, Libya, all these places, Syria, of course. And um, the people who didn't like this course, uh, Angela Merkel's cor um, uh, strategy, um, they could blame both the government and the media supporting it. So the, you had the two together. Uh, so media was part of government and government was part of the media concerning mm. the one big topic the whole country was talking about. Mm -hmm. And so you, uh, it connected and then uh, you could attack the two. Mm -hmm. Ruth? I, I think uh, building on what's been said, uh, especially Jason, there, there's, there's less, there's been less interest in democracy and more uh, a, and authoritarian leaders and solutions have had more appeal across the board. I also think that uh, democracy has not been its best advocate. Um, we've missed a, a lot of chances to, uh, for example, just on the, on the in speaking of visual language, uh, the power of symbols, the power of um, core values, uh, we've taken democracy for granted and haven't done a, a good job of, of arguing the case of why we need to invest in institutions. It's easier to hate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a healthy democracy and healthy civil society and institutions are all about horizontal bonds. But we have to do work to keep those bonds. Whereas authoritarianism says, you know, trust me, just have the vertical bond of the leader who will decide things for you. Mm -hmm. And and so I think it's a question of um, a lack of civic education, uh, a lack of imagination taking for granted, and uh, perhaps some some laziness. And and the the good part, the silver lining of what we're going through now, is many in many countries such as our own. I don't think people are going to take democracy for granted as they did in the past. Mm. Mathieu, I want to give you a chance to answer this, but I'm going to ask you a more specific question. Um, I found your, your presentation a little bit surprising. And my, my question when you were done is, 
what is Macron doing? Like, why is Macron, who's a, a kind of a, a centrist figure or sort of a, a normal politician, he's not a populist, he's not a right winger. As you said, he defeated somebody who had similar slogans to Donald Trump's. So what is this guy doing and why is he doing it? So, and I will come back to the, the, the question you asked first or after, but um, I think maybe it's very much connected and maybe it answers to your question. It's also very much connected with the political system we have and Klaus talks about Germany and Germany is very different in the political system than France. We have, as, like I say, like a Republican monarchy in France. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not new that, that the press was, was attacked and sometimes prevented from working in this very centralized country like France. Uh, what is new right now is that this guy who was elected like precisely uh, saying we're going to combat fake news, we're going to elevate the people, we're going to try to uh, open the society, he's doing exactly the contrary just because the political system works better for him when he does that. It doesn't mean that he builds trust, it doesn't mean that he, he makes a better society, but it just works better in this crazy political system in France that we have. So I think it's just doing that because the president is like a king, a Republican king in France. And so he has all the powers and this, can, this kind of idea that uh, in this system, accountability uh, coming from journalism doesn't really exist when it precisely hits uh, the, the the problem uh, problems concerning people very close to the presidency, the president himself. Uh, so it doesn't work anymore and the government has to protect himself. And so there is a very easy mechanism that, that comes and even the people like Macron who had the best promises in this system now uh, come to the point where they uh, they suppress uh, some some rights for for people and also for for the press, and so that's very sad because we've seen that under different presidencies. But now there are some new aspects of that, and it's also because um, there was a lot of social conflicts uh, recently, and so there was a lot of police violence in France, and uh, the, the 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 police violence uh, also that like, targeted journalists because the police is also like in the U.S. but it's a a national police, but the police is uh, sometimes rioting. Let's let's say that, and so so they they it, it happens like that. So that that's yeah, that's very sad. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, let's pick up on that because one of the striking things about the last uh, uh, 10, 12, uh, 14 days or so has been with this wave of demonstrations in the United States, we've seen a, a truly kind of shocking. Uh, inclusion of journalists in uh, crowds, they are being shot at, beaten, struck by the police the same way the demonstrators are. Not that they're being singled out, but they're being treated the same after it was fairly common for police departments in the United States to recognize that journalists were if you will, non-combatants in these kinds of situations. That was a fairly normal routine. Um, but now, seemingly out, all at once, and I'm not suggesting a conspiracy, I'm just asking how could this happen? Seemingly all at once, journalists are suddenly combatants. Um, and again, they're not being, it's, I'm not saying they're being singled out for rough treatment, but only that they no longer have any protected status at all. Um, so how did this happen? So what does it mean? I can, did you want Mathieu to answer or anybody? Ruth, fine. I, I mean, I think this is one, first of all, we have to, um, in, in the case of the United States, the police is uh, quite in, infiltrated uh, by extremists. Uh, white, from white power to other groups, um, far more than we have um, <clears throat> thought about. So they're coming to this with a different mentality. Uh, they're, they've been educated to see journalists as the enemy of the people. It's also a symptom of polarization, that there is no neutral ground. Everything is the us versus them in Jason's work. And the other thing that comes with that is a survivalist mentality. 
which mm -hmm. can come up especially at times of civil strife, right? But it's, it's ingrained. They're coming to the encounter already with this polarization, this survivalist, this right-wing um, extremist ideology. And so it becomes natural, quote unquote, to uh, unleash physical violence rather than consider them uh, neutral, neutral mm -hmm. parties. So just as there's no neutral players or no neutral participants, there's no neutral ground of truth, there's no neutral institutions, there's no neutral procedures, right? All these things that used to be taken for granted, you can't have that anymore. It's just uh, us against them. Jason, did you want to add to that? Unmute, please, Jason. I think that the uh, different elements that you talked about in your presentation are linked. The us versus them, the rejection of factuality, and the us versus them. That's why Trump had a hard time with COVID, and that's why these authoritarians have a hard time with COVID, because everything has to be us versus them, and reality is, uh, you know, not compliant there. As Arendt says, uh, you know, it's not enough for, to claim that unemployment has been eliminated. They must eliminate the collecting of unemployment statistics. Mm -hmm. Bolsonaro just eliminated coronavirus data, uh, the collection of coronavirus data. Um, so, so these, uh, and vis-a-vis -vis what's happening specifically with journalists who are being, obviously it's been successful, the politicizing of them. One thing that worries me, and just to build on Ruth's comments, um, just, yeah, to build on them, that uh, I think that Trump is going to be using crises to try to see which different parts of the state are on his side. And so uh, what we've been seeing is we've been seeing the successful result of this. And uh, Mathieu's point is that this is happening in the technocratic, uh, this is not a populist point. I mean, Macron is a technocrat, but technocratic uh, regimes are not democratic either. <laughs> and so it's not populism versus not pop versus, I hate that, I don't like the term populism. It's, uh, it's, those are not the right words because you can get technocratic autocrat as well. Um, so, uh, so I think, you know, we're seeing that a lot of law enforcement, as Ruth said, is uh, showing whose side they're on. Um, and, and that's what this is about. Let's see whose side the military is on. Let's see whose side people are on. Um, uh, Bolsonaro is way ahead here. Bolsonaro is to the point where he's explicitly saying, military, come depose the courts and the Congress. <laughs> you know, uh, but the military is like, nah, no thanks. Um, so, uh, so I think something like that's going on with law, with law enforcement now. Okay. Uh, Mathieu or Klaus, go ahead, Klaus. Uh, yeah, just to, to add uh, something which, which might be minor to what Ruth said. Um, there's something else going on too. Um, I want to build on that, what uh, Ruth said. Um, when I covered the demonstrations uh, or filmed there for the documentary film I'm doing, what I was really surprised to see was that a lot of demonstrators don't want to talk to the media anymore and are really aggressive. Yeah. I mean, we could see what happened to CNN in Atlanta. <laughs> and, um, and that's a common picture. It really happens. I think that's just a theory that two things really happen. First, Trump really succeeded with this term fake news and even the demonstrators are starting to believe in this. And then you hear lots of demonstrators complain that the media created Donald Trump, that they are mm. responsible. Um, these are two very different arguments, but uh, if you can connect the two, uh, you end up seeing some uh, surprising aggression from the left side towards the media. That's true. Uh, Mathieu, did you want to add something on this question? Or no, just, just because I'm, it's true that here in the picture, uh, you talk mostly about the U.S. and, and I talk more for the, for the French vision and Jason is right. Uh, I mean, this government in France right now is typically the, 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 the technocratic uh, government and, and it's a different aspect from the, the craziness, the, the, the Trumpian craziness uh, with all the aspects that you depicted. So, so there are, of course, heavy, heavy differences. But I think maybe in these differences, there are some things that, that may be interesting uh, for, for our discussion. Um, 
you can see like when you talk about why does the police target journalists, what happens in France where you try to report on the ground on police violence, for instance, when journalists, freelance journalists mostly because they like established journalists in established newsroom, maybe it's up, sometimes don't do this work. But you have this freelance journalist, they want to earn money, they want to do video. So they go very, very close on the ground with, with the video directly here uh, near the police man. And so they, they have a lot of, sh of videos and, and they are very easily targeted by the government as activists, as leftists, as uh, people who are not journalists. Mm -hmm. And so at some point you can say, yeah, maybe some, they have some agenda. Yeah, they may have some agenda, but they produce some kind of information. Like uh, these were all these journalists over the last two, three years in France, who, the, the, the main journalists who produced some very important information, this Ben Alas story that I've talked about, it was a freelance journalist uh, who just like had, was lucky enough to, to shoot this, this video that made, made them a huge scandal. So. Uh, it's very easy then for the power to say, look, to, to say to the other journalists, to say, look, they are not, they are, they, they are freelance activists. So, you know, we have this kind of, of idea that uh, uh, they have an agenda so they cannot be taken as journalists. And I think mm -hmm. something that we have to think about uh, because these people, maybe they have an agenda, but they do the work and, and they, they, they were uh, they were at the at the basis of some of the biggest scandals uh, against uh, when it comes to police brutality in the recent years in France. Mm -hmm. Well, that shows just how difficult this problem is because if we don't want the boundary between journalism and activism to be completely erased, the alternative to journalism as activism is usually um, some kind of neutrality, but neutrality isn't possible either with uh, the kind of war, constant atmosphere of war that somebody like Donald Trump uh, creates. So that it shows how how tricky this um, this subject is. Um, here's another question I want to ask you guys: When it became common for everyone to have a camera with them when they walked around because they have cell phones. And when cameras began to become routine equipment for police as well, some people, maybe I was one of them, thought that outright brutality and beatings would start to disappear because the costs of being found out would be so high in viral video and the kinds of investigations that follow from that. But that turned out to be wrong. So why hasn't the presence of cameras moderated the behavior of the police? Um, in, in fact, uh, be, because there was nothing more terrifying to the police than um, especially people of color who in the United States are the main targets of police brutality, being able to uh, record the brutality and being able to be witnesses um, and testify like that. Um, and it, it directly, you know, for, for kind of white supremacist, white nationalist mentality, this is absolutely the end of the world. This isn't supposed to happen. So it's a, it attacked not only a culture of impunity um, that we're seeing play out now, it attacked a, a world view, a racial world view, a racialized world view. And, it, and so instead of um, modifying, they, they um, became all the more arrogant and enraged. That's mm. my personal view of how things unfolded. And people like to be seen. They like to be watched. Uh, it's a surprise, isn't it? Uh, if you look at what's on Instagram and what's on Facebook these days, people don't shy away when they are being filmed. And that's even true in Minneapolis, which uh, I think surprised everybody. Um, the, the four cops looking at the cameras and then still continuing. Um, but people like to be filmed. Jason. Unmute, Jason. So I think that 
this question has a lot to do with the structure that is the police now, which the film, which all the cameras have revealed to us and revealed to us over a course of years. Uh, our black fellow citizens have been telling us this, but we haven't been many, we, many of us have not been listening. Uh, and these cameras revealed something about a structure. There's a great piece in today's Atlantic by my colleague Tracy Mears, my colleagues Tracy Mears and Tom Taylor. Uh, Professor Mears was on Obama's 21st Century Policing Commission. And what she says is that the police is an institution that's been formed not by reflection, but as a response, but as a series of responses to crises. And when you're responding to crisis, then racism comes in because when you're responding to crisis, you're not thinking or reflecting. And so what we've done is we've constructed a milit hyper militarized police. We've trained them to dominate, to treat everything like domination. Uh, so, and what the cameras are revealing is the structure that is the police. And the question that the demonstrators, what the demonstrators are demanding is that we dismantle the structure and reconstruct a new structure that is thoughtful. Uh, let's not put our, um, put our uh, you know, all of the a city's resources into law enforcement. Let's, and have law enforcement deal with the consequences of failures of public schools, failures of hospitals, failures of, of uh, all sorts of public institutions. So journalism has been a real story. Citizen journalism and journalism generally has been a real hero, I think, in the last few years. Mm. Um, thank you, Jason. Uh, okay, my, my next question, I, wanna, I want you guys to try and give me some help with a problem that I've had for three years now. And the problem begins with a statement that Marty Barron, the editor of the Washington Post, who, in my view, is kind of the unofficial leader of the American press. Um, he has said several times in, when asked about um, covering Donald Trump, we are not at war, we're at work. We're not at war with the president, we're at work. We're, we're, and on the one hand, I recognize the brilliance of this statement because what it says is, we're not gonna play his game, right? We're gonna continue to do our job. We're gonna remain calm. We're not going to allow him to provoke us. Um, we're, we're not gonna play into his attempt to demonize us and make us the enemy of the people. We're just gonna continue to report the news. Another thing that makes it a brilliant statement is that it leans into the culture of the press because it's it's kind of a stoicism. It's um, you you can say whatever you want about me. You can attack me. Um, I'm not the story. I'm just going to continue to do my work, which is pretty much what television reporters say when people ask them about um, one of these episodes where Trump attempts to sort of dismantle or insult a reporter live on television. Their first answer almost always is, look, I'm not the story. So, so we're not at war, we're at work, participates in this idea that journalists are not in the spotlight. They're just getting information. So it makes sense. It, it, and, and it's incredibly popular that this is like totally the common sense of the journalism profession. If we, if we could take a poll on this statement, it would be like 98 to two uh, among professional journalists that they would say, yeah, that's right. We're not at war, we're at war. Okay, so that's, that's on, the, on the understandable side. But my, the, the other problem with this is, well, it is a war. And Trump would like to destroy all trust in the press. And he wants to dominate and kind of take over this institution and make it all about him, which in many ways he is succeeding in doing. Um, he wants to frighten the companies that employ journalists, which he does directly uh, by talking about uh, a punishment he's gonna mete out to Jeff Bezos, for example, and the failing New York Times, right? He would love to 
undermine the companies that employ uh, journalists. And he is definitely at war in the sense of persuading his fans that they should hate these people and disregard what they report. So it is a war, right? Can you help me? What do I say to Marty Barron? I've been trying to figure this out for three years. So we have this group of historians, journalists from other countries, philosophers, um, who wants to help me? Klaus, you wanna start? On yeah, mute. It's diff yeah, yeah, sorry. It's difficult, of course, but, um, but look at the, the other slogan from the Washington Post, democracy dies in darkness. Uh, that's the one they are commercializing. That's the one you see whenever you open uh, their app. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not running the Marty Baron slogan. And um, the, the, the fact checking they do and uh, the meaning checking Trump's lies, it's 20,000 right now, isn't it? Um, yes. after, after three years, rid, rid, ridiculous number. Um, they commercialize that too, because whenever they, they come up with a new number, they put it out there. Uh, so I'm sure they themselves uh, think, uh, yes, we are in a war, but we have to keep the image out there that we are just doing our work. Mm -hmm. Jason? So this is what I talked to. This is, a tr this is the trap I talked about with faux objectivity. You find this all the way back to Mein Kampf. This, I, you know, Hitler talks about faux objectivity. And so the problem is that journalists, because uh, journalists walk right into it, uh, because you have to make value judgments. When you choose, for example, to, to focus on property damage in protests rather than the message. You're making a value judgment. Uh, when you choose, okay, the property damage isn't the main story. Uh, you're making a value judgment. And so the idea that you're not making value judgments, look, there's a 70 year literature in philosophy descending from Richard Rudner's paper, the scientist qua scientist makes value judgments. Uh, so if physicists make value judgments, Journalists do too, because, you know. So, uh, so the idea that there's not, there's no, there's no conflict between. You've got to make a claim. You've got to take a stand on what's central to the story. That's a bet. Um, so, you know, this and that is tracking the truth. Uh, so, uh, so resisting, resisting this uh, false conception of objectivity uh, is 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 important. Uh, because you're always going to be revealed. It's like, oh, you think you're just at work. You're just faking because you're making a value judgment. You just described my latest post for my blog, PressThink.org. Thank you very much. Um, Matthew, did you want to get in on this yeah. one? Yeah, I wanted two words on that. Uh, and, and then also about objectivity and neutrality. I'm very, I agree with, with Jason very much. Uh, the first thing is that uh, I'm, as a, as a U.S. correspondent, so I'm not doing news in the US for a US audience. I'm more trying to uh, tell my, my, my audience about what's happening in the US. And I must say that I'm always very surprised. So when, of course, there are two sides, like you have the opinion pages and you have like the, uh, the, 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 the um, traditional, like the, the, the other sections. Uh, so it's very separate in the US, maybe it's less separate in, in Europe, but, um, I, I'm really surprised all these debates in the US about does the New York Times say that New, Donald Trump is lying? Yes, he is lying. And the, the US press should say that. Yes, he is blatantly lying every day. And he is like, I, I think I saw that in one of your posts some, some years ago. Uh, he is flooding the zone with shit like Steve Bannon told him uh, to do. And this is, this is working. So as journalists, we must describe what's happening here. We must say this is a, a, which this is constant lies. We must say we must describe this strategy uh, because our readers need to understand that, but also because it's true. So we need to give the systemic view of that and not, and not shy in describing that like that. 
as I'm not shy in describing this style of, of governing as uh, nearly authoritarian. He, if, if he was in another political structure, he would be totally uh, an authoritarian leader. And, uh, and to describe also the system as a plutocracy, because th that's what it is. Uh, his main supporters is not just the crazy Donald Trump, it's a plutocracy. Uh, so I, 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 I think we need to use this word uh, because it's about that. So yeah. we don't have to be shy about that. I'm not sure that right. everybody agrees on that. But And the second thing about objectivity and neutrality, very shortly, um, for instance, I can give you my example. In my media, we are a very famous investigative website in France, but we also say that we have a progressive view on things and that we are for an open society, we have for to publish, and we want to publish information in the public interest. So we are not for a party, for a politician, but we are more I would say a progressive slash left media. So you have a you have a contract with the reader. So some people, the people know where you talk from, and I think that this contract uh, is important. Um, I totally understand that it may not be the what other journalists want to do, other newsrooms want to do, but at least we say we say this is where we talk from so we are not for any politician for nobody but we, we publish information on left wing right wing centrist people on all kinds of business and 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 but and we write all kinds of stories but i it's not it's not a problem for me to say where you are speaking from as but you have to publish uh, really accurate stories when you when you do investigation work it has to be really well done and and not not a single word must be must be attacked but uh, it's not bad to to say what is your general very general vision of the world and nobody not everybody in the newsroom agrees on everything of course but at least that your reader knows who you are yeah Okay, I'm gonna ask one more question and then we're going to um, go to the Q&A with the audience portion of, of the event. Um, between now and November 3rd, all of these pressures we've been talking about are going to increase greatly. I think we can all agree on that. And the system is gonna come under even more pressure than it's under now. And a lot of this is going to uh, come down on journalists. We have here a philosopher of fascism. We have an historian of Italian uh, fascism. We have uh, a German journalist who I'm sure is uh, highly aware of his own country's history with uh, fascism. We have the uh, example of uh, the French occupation uh, uh, and the loss of freedom uh, then. Um, uh, so as uh, as the, the political system heats up, becomes more authoritarian, where the outlines of fascism begin to be shown, uh, what advice do we have as, as learned people, students of history, students of this, of this, uh, this phenomenon for US journalists? Like what should, kinds of things should they be doing besides what we've said uh, so far? What, what, what would you advise them to do? Ruth, do you want to take a shot at it? Um, I was going to say for the last question that's relevant for this, that uh, if Trump is reelected, uh, Mr. Barron will have to get ready to change his tune because Trump uh, long ago asked uh, Comey about jailing jur jur journalists um, and it's not going to be possible to um, remain uh, you know, out of the fray. I think um, these, these historical windows in which it's still possible to stop things only come around, uh, you know, at certain moments in history. And again, it's, um, I think that things will look very different. Um, I think that I've been trying to say, as you know, since 2017 to stop amplifying Trump this is the 24-7. I think it was Klaus who made the point. He, he's, he's succeeded magnificently in, in, and it plays into his cult of personality in colonizing, because authoritarians want to colonize our attention and our society and our way of thinking, and everything's about him. Um, and 
And so trying to step back and seeing the bigger picture and not retweeting him, it's, uh, basic things that I, I wrote a Washington Post op-ed, uh, I've written many pieces about this, uh, what to do, how to push back on his propaganda machine, but they haven't quite been uh, actu actuated either by the public and, or by the press, and this is the problem. Um, I think that each of us here, um, like what I've been trying to do since 2016 is to educate, do a kind of a work of civic education on what the dangers are of authoritarianism and personality cults. But also, and I, I'm not trying to say this in, in any kind of arrogant way, but to educate the American press who may not, it, it's been difficult for them to see the Trump in this frame. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, cable news, the historians uh, on, on contract who are wonderful are all American historians. Uh, they don't have people on as, as often as they might who see things from the history of authoritarianism. So, so that's what I would say. It's, it, it's a paradigm shift and it's very difficult and people are in denial, but it's going to be necessary to try and, and, and get there. Jason, on mute. You wouldn't have a philosopher on the panel if you didn't have disagreement. So, uh, so Ruth, uh, there's a lot most, as always, I agree with most of what she says, but just for disagreement's sake, but also a lot of my work is about the United States. When I write about fascism, I write about the United States, how we, because I'm very patriotic and I don't like this thing of giving the Germans and the Italians credit for anything, for everything. I mean, they got a lot from us. Hitler praises us in Mein Kampf. You know, uh, one of my mentors is Noam Chomsky. He always used to say to me, you think you have it bad? Do you know what it's like? I always had two FBI agents in my class in every single class. Uh, you know, we, we went through the post 9-11 stuff. We saw the newspapers, uh, you know, fold before the Bush administration. So I, I think, uh, you know, there's some kind of paradigm shift in cer certain ways, like the, there's less, one way Federico Fink Finkelstein puts it is, uh, you know, uh, when you're trying to distinguish fascist lying from, you know, the normal kind of government lying, like under the Bush administration, they were, they were taking us seriously. They were trying to de deceive us with the media's right. help. Uh, now they're not trying to deceive us. They're just trying to trash the media and just say it's us versus them. So that, that's a difference. But um, I think there are this one, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a major administ administrator of a major university today, and he says, here's our problem in addressing the protests. Our problem in addressing the protests is, uh, you know, our donors all got rich via structural racism. So we can't address structural racism, really, because that would piss our donors off. Um, and newspapers face a similar problem. When I read the op-ed editor of the New York Times saying, we don't question capitalism here. Well, you know, <laughs> I want the journalists to say, who's profiting? Where's the money coming from? Do an article on the money. Uh, like, how come not, not focusing on all the people who got rich from the CARES Act? Democrat, and how the Democrats and the Republicans helped make a lot of people rich. Uh, so focus on the money. And I think that there's a lot and show that no one is free from corruption here. And then maybe that will get some trust back. But you know, you're not supposed to criticize capitalism. Yeah. Well, we're over time um, for this segment. Uh, so thank you very much. And I want to turn it over to the audience now. So Sarah, maybe you want to take it away. Uh, I think actually I'm I'm gonna read some okay, questions uh, if you don't mind uh, yep. that have come in uh, from the Q and A. Just let me look for where they are right now. Um, just one second, and I will start uh, with a question from Michael Scott Moore, and he asked, "How have journalists been treated by the German police at recent demonstrations?" in comparison to the United States. In the US, it seems clear that the cops don't like to be recorded, uh, as Ruth was just saying, or do German police have a different method? Thank you. Even though he didn't mention me, this question uh, went to me. Um, <laughs> the, um, there was a minor incident to 
today I'm not really able to to explain much. I just uh, before this session started, I just read about it. I don't know the details yet. There was an incident uh, with demonstrators in Germany being put against the wall and they had to stand there, but I can't really explain it so uh, yet because I don't know much about it yet. But in general, um, there's not the same there's not the same amount of aggression. There's not um, um, there's not this strong force being used against the press. Um, the media aren't um, aren't the enemy of the people from the police's perspective. Not yet. That might happen, but it's we're not there yet in Germany. So there's less aggression. You see it, of course, whenever there's. Um, incidents after soccer games that's uh, quite famous in Germany or after political demonstrations. Um, there are some riots, but journalists are pretty much out of it. So not the same amount of aggression there. Okay, so let me read the next question. Uh, that comes from Devon Powers and they're saying, People were very distrustful of journalists long before Trump. Trust in journalism has been eroding for decades. While the turn towards violence may be new, it seems incorrect to suggest that journalists are a recent addition to quote unquote hated groups. Moreover, journalists these days are getting flagged not just from the right and far right, but also from the left, in parenthesis, the recent flap at the New York Times over the cotton piece is a good example. So how do you square journalists as hate objects with this history and widespread suspicion about journalism? Well, it's true. Um, trust in the press has been declining for a long time. Um, if you simply look at poll results, it's began in mid seventies and it's been going down with some uh, motion up and down for a while, uh, but uh, recently it has not only turned down dramatically, but has been sharply polarized in the age of, of Trump where almost everybody who identifies with Trump or votes for him is uh, hugely mistrustful of the mainstream media. Um, and Democrats are increasingly trusting of the mainstream media but the polarization is uh, extreme. Nonetheless, there's, it's true that we cannot blame this decline on, on Trump, but we don't exactly know what the other answers are either. So there's, there's a few possibilities. One is trust in the political system as a whole is declining. Journalists are seen as part of that system, not separate from it. So that's one answer. Um, another answer that I've tried to develop in my work is that, um, especially in the mid 80s and from after that point, American journalists uh, reporting on politics tended to identify with the operators of the system, with the spin doctors, the handlers, the pollsters, the professionals who run campaigns the people who advise the candidates, um, the, the chief strategist of the candidates. Uh, uh, well, another way to look at this is, if you asked a, a, a room full, 200 people who are all political journalists, how many people here feel qualified to be uh, president? Very few would raise their hand. How many feel qualified to be secretary of the treasurer? Maybe one or two would raise their hand. If you asked them if they were qualified to be secretary of state, Maybe one person, Ted Koppel, would raise his hand. But if you ask them, how many people feel qualified to be the chief strategist of a, of a presidential campaign, everybody would raise their hands. And so, there, so that's this turn towards insider journalism, the journalism of the game, which I know has happened in Germany as well. Um, I think that is partly responsible for a uh, decline in trust. And then there's, of course, the fact that with a multi-channel world and the internet as a source of information, um, lots of things happen that weren't possible before. So for example, the internet is great at uh, producing falling costs for like-minded people to find each other, share information and realize how many of them there are. 
So that falling cost for like-minded people to find each other works for people who are very dissatisfied with the media. Now they know how many of them there are and they begin to organize themselves and they find heroes and champions for that point of view. Uh, also, the internet makes it possible for people to uh, obtain versions of reality that contradict what the media is reporting. Uh, sometimes uh, in, a, in, a good, in a good way, like criticism that is valid, but they can also, of course, access um, conspiracy theory and, and other uh, forms of, in, of disinformation that cause them to mistrust uh, the media as well. So, so that's involved. Um, and I think there's something, I don't know what it is exactly, but I think there's something about 24 hour cable news that is just the way that it's done in the United States. Probably the fact that it's, it's so entertainment based, you know, based on characters and, and repeating situations like TV shows are. Um, I think there's something about that that's deeply corrosive as well. Again, capitalism, may I point out, <laughs> is, is a problem. The desire to get hits, the desire to get read so you can sell for advertising, and yet we can't talk about it. So that, that's symbiotic with the authoritarian desire for uh, eyeballs. So until we, you know. All right, so I will read the next question here. Hold on. Um, and that is uh, from an anonymous attendee who asks, how do you view the role of fictional conspiracy theories in bolstering the power of authoritarian leaders and undermining public trust in journalism? Um, I can start in on that. So um, I think one interesting difference uh, of propaganda, of fascist propaganda uh, 100 years ago and now is that um, Mussolini and, and Hitler, but especially Mussolini tried to, they had sense, they censored certain information and made other information the only thing circulating. And in the 21st century, you have um, uh, conspiracy theory is embedded very deeply into the fabric of information manipulation. And the goal, and Putin has done this very well, is to leave people uncertain about everything. Um, with a few, you know, the leader cult is safe and continues on, but to, to sow confusion and exhaust people um, and so that there's fewer people who uh, have the, the stamina to get to the truth. And it's easier after a while to just say what the leader tells you. And of course, Trump has been uh, a conspiracy theorist for many decades, um, not just the very famous episode of the birther conspiracy of, you know, trying to say Obama uh, wasn't <clears throat> born here, so he shouldn't be president, but in many other spheres. Um, so it's part of his information warfare um, and, and it's part of uh, all, all the others, but it's, it's rooted in fascism, but it's taken on a far, um, a, a far more prominent role, I would say, than it did during the classic fascist period. Did anybody else want to address that? Uh, yeah, um, just quickly, there's a trap that is very common, which Trump uh, Trump did in 2012 with birtherism. You, you take your conspiracy theory and you say, and the conspiracy theory always involves the press. The press is always part of the conspiracy theory. So what you do, like take the Hitler version, the Nazi version, the press, the Jews control the press, according to Hitler. Uh, and you can tell that they control the press because they don't report that the Jews control the press. So it puts the press in this bind. Uh, Trump made this move in 2012 when he said, Obama controls CNN. You can tell because CNN doesn't report that Obama might have been born in Kenya. 
So it puts, uh, you said the same thing with law and justice in Poland, with PIS, with the Smolensk disaster. They, they were like, oh, the press is not reporting these conspiracy theories, so they're in on the conspiracy theory. So that puts the press in a bind. If they don't report the conspiracy theory, they're in on the conspiracy theory. And if they report the conspiracy theory, then they give it greater credence. Either way, it tarnishes the press. And that's a move that Trump is very good at. That's why the press is reporting on Obamagate, isn't it? Yeah. It is exactly why the press is reporting on Obamagate. And right now, oh, this is very important to discuss. We're not, right now, we have a clear fascist reversal of reality. They're trying to reverse engineer QAnon. Um, they're, they're cherry picking facts from the past, and they're simply trying to reverse engineer reality and getting the press to go along with it. And it's extreme, and we're watching, it's always the fascist thing to call your opponent uh, what you are. So now they're saying, you know, oh, Obama politicized the Justice Department because the, uh, the um, it, what was impeachment about politicizing the Justice Department? So now, so, the, so people need to be savvy about this and not fall into these traps. All right, thank you. Let me deliver the next question here. Um, that is addressed to Jay, but it could, of course, also be addressed by, by, by the other ones. Uh, it comes from Select L1 or Lee, I'm not quite sure. How do you explain the public's refusal, refusal to review clear facts, uh, proven science-based, video-based, etc., and acceptance of real facts? i.e. some people believe the George Floyd footage is fake. Jay, do you want to start? Well, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, <laughs> um, I can see lots of reasons why it's easier to distribute conspiracy theories these days. Um, I can point out, as I did in my opening presentation, uh, how political leadership contributes to that loss of reality. Um, but why people prefer a kind of made up world to the one that we're actually living in, I find that a very alienating phenomena to, to, to study. And one of the weirdest things about our present moment is that social media is extremely effective at surfacing for political leadership the demand for something to be true. When we talk about disinformation, we almost always focus on the suppliers of disinformation, the people who are trying to disinform us. We almost never start the inquiry from the demand side of disinformation. And one of the things that Facebook in particular is incredibly effective at is surfacing the demand for something to be true when it is not. And this is how Trump launched his political career, behind the excess demand that was building up for Obama to be born in Kenya. Right? Uh, and he's not born in camera, but there's still a demand for that fact, right? regardless of whether it's true or not. And I, I understand how that system works as a system. I just find it really hard to understand why individual people believe in it. And it's, and it's, it's, um, it's frustrating. Just, maybe, Thank you. Yeah, just a small sentence on that. I think it comes back uh, and Jay has said great things and, and I just, would like to add that it comes back to what also Jason said about, and, and Jay also said about the system and the whole economy of all that. Uh, like people don't believe journalists. I mean, many people or some people may be doubtful towards journalists, let's put it like that, because it's also, there are still a lot of people, uh, like we see during the pandemic, we had like in France, many people subscribing to media to understand what's happening. So don't, yeah, th there are some also some more some hopeful stories. 
But some people believe that journalists belong to some kind of system, as you say, that is not really trying to looking for the truth. So we, we really have, I think, through maybe new, new outlets, maybe new media adventures, new ways of telling stories, we have to prove them that it's not true that we are we are looking to make the, the powerful accountable that we want to tell stories that are connected with what they live and also to try to explain them the, the complexity of the of the of the structures that are today at stake in our society and and i mean it's for me it's the main i i, I can totally understand when people don't trust the media and we have all made this experience that you need to talk five hours to somebody who doesn't trust the media uh, to try to convince them and at the end you're not sure that it works but when you engage and when you try to, to when, when you when you when, when you explain how you work and how so when you work for me you, like, like me for instance for a media that shows consistently consistently sorry that you publish stories on uh, the people on the left the people on the right whoever uh, that you don't you are not shy in in publishing s stories with impact mm -hmm. so then the trust comes back a little bit but you have you have to uh, to repair this fabric like every day and and i think like it should be the the role or the idea that every journalist has his hand in his mind. I know it's very difficult sometimes when you are in media structures that don't really allow you to do that. But I think that should be the priority, uh, even if it's difficult. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, let me move on to the next question. And that um, comes from uh, Liesl Schillinger and she submitted two questions. I'm going to concentrate on the second question. Um, given the precarity of the upcoming election and the lack of clear and enforceable constitutional protections of electoral processes under Bar McConnell, what can journalists do to defend themselves and democratic institutions if Trump does not go? Thinking back to Arendt, masses caught up in totalitarianism, enthralled to the autocrat, believing objective truth, believing in nothing but their own imaginations and the consistency of the autocrat's political style. Is there any solution that can come before the departure of the autocrat? Mm -hmm. Who wants to tackle that? Um, I can just tackle part of it. Um, I think that something very, this is very practical, um, but um, one thing I've noticed since uh, Trump came on the scene is American coverage has become more like Italian coverage, meaning Italian uh, journalism often doesn't step back to give you the big picture. You're kind of in the flux of events. And if you're not um, living it, it's, they don't do the background pieces. And I think that to trying to keep up with everything, all these, all the villains who are distinguishing themselves like Barr, we, we don't have enough background pieces that explain very clearly who these people are, what their worldview is, <clears throat> and what threat that they present very specifically uh, in a, and with certain outcomes. If Trump doesn't leave, so for Barr, he's a great example. Um, there are plenty of articles on what he's doing now and, and his mis missteps and cover-ups and this, but um, letting people see the true danger of this person, for example, would help us to realize what uh, he is capable of in the future. So that's just a very practical thing that I think journalists can uh, do better on. Here's another one. Um... I think the big news organizations, the Washington Post, CNN, NBC, NPRs of the world should start threat modeling right now. Threat modeling is a known discipline. And there are plenty of people with advanced knowledge of how these things happen, including, for example, the authors of How Democracies Die. But it's not just them. There's many other people who could tell you what to watch for. And there should be threat modeling teams at these news organizations now starting work on how it could happen and 
one of the products that they could um, make is sort of what to watch for lists, things to look for uh, as, uh, the, as the peak danger uh, approaches. Um, and that's a lot better than waiting for stuff to happen and then sending reporters to it. Um, but I don't know if our newsrooms are that far-sighted to do that. And I'm not sure they're taking this threat seriously enough. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we have a, another election-related question that is uh, directly addressed to Klaus, but perhaps also to the others. After watching the United States retreat into a more pugnacious foreign policy stance after 9-11, do you feel the social environment in the US has progressed to the point where a more liberal leader can, and that's in all caps, achieve political victory in November? Uh, Klaus, you're being asked uh, to be Cassandra. Please, please unmute yourself, Klaus. You're right. Yes, I should always unmute myself. Um, oh, it's so difficult uh, to be Cassandra in this country. And um, I mean, every election result tends to be overrated in terms of um, you have these very small shifts um, concerning the results, and then huge trends are are going to um, are going to be written about in the media. Um, I'm not sure about a, a real shift in the society, but of course it can shift back. Definitely it can. And then if uh, Biden wins, the Democrats win, if they really manage to, to gain control of both uh, chambers of Congress, then real change in the society is possible, yes. Anybody else or should we move on to the next question? Jason? Unmute yourself, please. Uh, just a quick point about the society. Uh, what And hooking into things Jay said as well, um, building on them, the culture wars. Trump changes the subject constantly to the culture wars. So whenever, whenever uh, you know, he wants to change the subject, he calls it the Chinese virus, and then everyone writes about the culture wars. And it's no longer about incompetence. It's about, oh, you called him racist, and it wasn't really racist and he's gonna own the libs. So it's all about the culture wars. One thing the media can do is back off the damn culture wars. Like, like the culture, truce on the culture wars. Stop doing the outrage about the outrage. No more stories about college campuses. Like, you know, uh, you know the Oberlin story should have been a real, there are these narratives that have been set up and the narratives are like rampaging students, denying people, the right for sushi because it's cultural appropriation. And like that Oberlin story should have been a wake up call. Nothing happened about, so, so many newspapers published an article claiming that there were like big protests at Oberlin about sushi not being culturally, uh, being cultural appropriation. Uh, and it was complete bunk, no factuality at all, but it fit into a narrative. And you have that and you have all of these people who claim they're not Trump supporters, but feeding into the culture war that brings Trump to, uh, to that, that, that helps Trump. Maybe if students do something, maybe that's a front page story, I don't know. But like these narratives are dominating like the, the newspapers. Uh, outrage, what are the leftists doing now? And I wish the newspapers would fact check some of them, would do more nuanced reporting. The narratives have a lot of power. My uh, advice to the press covering the campaign is a sentence that I keep repeating, hoping that repetition will eventually make it sink in. And that is this, you can't keep from getting sucked into Trump's agenda without a firm grasp on your own agenda. So you have to have a set of priorities that predate the machinations and tactics and exceed or override the Trump hurricane. And um, only if you have your own agenda 
can you keep from getting sucked into the vortex of Trump's agenda? Of course, the reason I put it this way is that it's difficult for our news organizations to admit that they have any agenda at all, because to them, that's a dirty word and you're not supposed to do that. And they suppose, you know, that's the end of journalism. But in fact, without that kind of self-generated priority list, they will get sucked into the Trump vortex again, as they did in 2016, even though they're highly aware of the uh, role they played in 2016. These would be great final words, but I'll leave room for one more final question. Uh, okay. And uh, here it comes. Uh, it comes from Devin Powers and uh, they say, the elephant in the room here is race. Many protesters uh, who come from the black community, immigrant communities, etc., have seen themselves misrepresented, ignored, and abused by the press for decades, which may explain why protesters are hostile toward the press. So might it be possible that while Trump has certainly sown a lot of division, he hasn't caused the left or progressive to dislike journalists? And the press for black people has never been neutral. Absolutely true. I think it's a perfectly valid analysis and captures a very important truth about journalism in the United States. Uh, no dissenting views, I sense. Uh, I, I just want, I want to amplify that, that unless we have, uh, you know, Brazil was really shocking like this uh, when I, I went there in March and, uh, you know, there's a huge problem with lack of representation. Over 50% of the country is black and there are hardly any black journalists in, in newspapers. Uh, and as a result, you don't know what's going on in, in communities that are most affected by, uh, by social upheaval. And that's been happening in the United States. And obviously journalism is deeply implicated in the law and order politics it, throughout the 1990s, crime was dropping rapidly, and instead of covering that, journalism just covered lurid crime after lurid crime, and, and that's, you know, uh, responsible for where we find ourselves today. All right, well, Thank we've uh, run out of time. Uh, there were more questions. We might have to schedule a sequel event, um, perhaps closer to the elections. But I would like to thank you all. Thank you, Jay, Ruth, Jason, Klaus, Mathieu, and Zara also for working very hard behind the scene. And uh, keep up the good work. Uh, all you in the audience, keep thinking, do good critical thinking, um, and uh, do the right thing. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.